welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan-Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. On today's episode of The Heal Podcast, I sit down with the beautiful Tiffany Persons. Tiffany founded Tiffany Company Casting, whose mission is to get to the heart of the matter by casting real people with real stories and real feelings about the brands they represent. Her work is changing the landscape of media by ensuring that all shapes, sizes, colors, genders, etc. are represented. We talk about why it is imperative to have diversity and representation in media and how essential a feeling of belonging is to our mental and physical health. Tiffany also founded Shine On Sierra Leone. We discussed the magic that unfolded when she followed a calling to do a documentary in Sierra Leone and the lives she has touched as a result. Tiffany is a light and a spiritual warrior, and I cannot wait to dive in. So just um, for our listeners who aren't quite familiar with your work, Mm -hmm. maybe you could just give a little, share what you do and how you got to do the work that you're doing. Wow. Well, I am the founder of an organization called Shine on Sierra Leone. I also um, have a casting company for real people casting. That's the people that you see that are real family members and um, real couples and all that good fun stuff. Tiffany Company Casting, and I'm also the Director of Empathy at David and Goliath Advertising Agency, which is fairly recent and a really extraordinary story of how that came to be. Um, And yeah, I think that's, and I'm basically a vibrational, I like to call myself a vibration architect, an inner engineer, and that's my daily, (laughs) my daily, not job, but gift yeah to be able to co-create in this way i know you said when we talked before this interview you talk about how your life is your ministry or your life is your yes your work your teaching is you you're yeah. embodying your you know you are a co-creator and you're embodying yeah. that and taking it into every area of work that you do so yes. i'm excited to talk about all of it today I know. I know. let's first talk about Director of Empathy at a <laughs> huge advertising agency. Um, mm. What is that? Was that something you created and presented? Was that how did that come to be? And what do you do? Wow. Well, as we know, the pandemic has given us uh, so many profound shifts. We'll call it right. You know, some have been painful, others have been remarkable. And during the revolution, right last June. I picked up the phone and I called my friend David Angelo, who's the founder of David and Goliath Advertising Agency. And having been a casting director for the past 15 years, I felt so inspired to connect with him so that I could speak to the agency about the content that was being created. Who was at the table? Who wasn't at the table? I'm the one who's been for the last decade and more receiving these specs for, you know, we're looking for Caucasian, we're looking for this. You know, I have experienced what that has been like. And I just wanted to share with them from my perspective. And I said, David, can I come do a workshop? Didn't know what workshop I was going to do, but I knew I was going to create it. And I was going to speak from the heart and share something that had really probably never been shared. And he said, without hesitation, absolutely. But then he called me back a week later and said, you know what, I actually want to create a role for you here at the agency, and I'd like for you to be the director of empathy because I believe that empathy is truly the ingredient that is so essential for anything to truly change in our country and in our world. And I said, well, of course. (laughs) (laughs) And I accept. And I accept. What a gift. Um, And to also to be prepared for such an assignment for me is the true gift and to know that I have walked this this journey my my, I guess my lifetime of healing myself is what has prepared me for such a an awesome assignment 
I know. And it's so cool because I know that we've read a lot of the same, you know, yes. personal growth books and on the similar, you know, we have similar spiritual beliefs and um, member of the same spiritual community, the agape, and, you know, here and there. And, um, yeah. and so we're very aligned. And so when you say you co-create with life, this, mm. this specific story that you're telling is like such an example for me because it happens in my life as well. It's like you do the work and you show up and all of a sudden a company, a, a massive corporation, you know, or a company then creates a position out of thin air that's exactly. ideal for what your gifts are to share with the world. That's like, yes. that is the perfect example of how we are co-creators. And when we do the work so on true. ourselves, the universe answers and provides us with the path and the avenue and the opportunity. Absolutely. That's it. And so that has really been how my life has gone for, for my most of my adult life, but I had so much resistance many years ago because I thought I had to go upstream, right? I have to create it. I have to knock down the doors. And then um, going through a healing journey, which I look forward to sharing in a moment, you know, I now realize I really don't have to do that much work. The work is so internal. And it's, it's exponentially... Um, profound the amount that you can get done if you just work on we if I just work on my internal landscape my emotional landscape it's it gives me chills to think that this is really like what a great gift to be alive and to be able to do this and all of us can do this mm. Yes, and that is the healing. That is the that's what yes. we're here for. That's what we're. I yes. just interviewed Gary Zukoff, and he's talking about the Earth School and how we, for the last however many thousands of years, we've been pursuing external power out of survival, right. and we are in this middle of a shift in consciousness where we turn it within, mm. and all of our outside circumstances are reflecting back to us the wounds, and the fears that we still harbor within ourselves. So it's so nice to meet a sister that is on the same, same. awareness journey. And, yes. and, you know, it's not always easy, but to if right. someone's out there triggering you, treating you unfairly, you know, violating you in some way, rather than make them the enemy, mm. it's turning within and going, where, where am I calling in this into my life? Or, you know, where, where do I still need to heal so that I don't need this experience to teach me? you know exactly exactly and that's such a Kelly I think you'll agree it's a tough one you know it's a tough one it is a big pill to swallow how dare you say that I am responsible for this horrible thing that is happening to me or has happened to me and and I like to look at it more so okay it's unknowing we didn't we don't we're not knowingly doing this but if we really do understand that we are all vibrational beings. There is nothing that is solid on this planet. We're all vibrating at, at different speeds. That's science, right? I can't make this up. So if we're all vibrating at different speeds and whatever speed we're vibrating at, we're having life experiences that also mirror that vibration. Well, that's just math, right? And I really want to look at how can we what if we understood the superpower that we have to focus and shift our vibration to the higher levels and then watch the world around us transform? Wow. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And we do have that superpower. We do. And it's just developing the awareness so that we can, again, turn within and shift our own frequency and then watch the world around us shift. Yeah as well yeah. and then yes and understanding that we have literally been um told and and suppressed out of the knowing that that is our superpower from the time that we are the first no right our first no you can't do that we're a toddler and we're you know we're literally programmed out of our knowingness i remember being a young person and always being in connection with spirit i don't even know what i called it i just was in conversation, always, and creating as I went along. And I remember really just kind of creating magic, saying this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and having this wonderful, very normal experience until I was basically moved out of it by our society, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yep, cultural conditioning. Yeah. And we're all in it, like fish in the ocean. We yes. don't know we're in it, but yes. we're in it. That's right. I would S- definitely want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I would want to talk about that. So um, you mentioned a healing journey. Do you want to share with us? What yeah. Um, my fast track to healing, you know, my healing journey started when I was 21, and I was going through some really tough times in college, you know, bad things were always befalling upon me, you know, whether it was, you know, didn't pay speeding tickets and my license is suspended to just always something going on. And so I don't remember exactly what was going on, but things were tough. And I got on my knees and prayed. Now, you know, when you get on your knees, I, I don't know about you is, but when you, I got on my knees and prayed, I mean, things were pretty bad. <laughs> yes. So I literally got on my knees. And I went to a Catholic school most of my life. And so, therefore, I had the blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. That I'm used to playing, praying to. And on this particular day, I just, you know, pictured my blue eyed, blonde hair Jesus. And I just looked up at him and I said, Who are you? <laughs> Who are you? And what is this all about? That was what I said out loud. That was my prayer. And the next day, someone knocked at my door. And when I got to the door, no one was there. And I looked down, and there was the book Celestine Prophecy. What? The year was 1995. And I was shook and I, I, I by at that time reading was not a big thing I was not a part of my daily regimen and I picked up the book and it took me a couple months and I read that book and yes yes everything in my body said yes mm-hmm. to this even though we know that it is a fictional novel it is simply based on the laws of the universe and the laws of attraction and so I started to live my life as if that was true and when I tell you my life just started to turn around and it was amazing, right? I was just magic. I was just walking around being magic. And then something happened where I started to put my focus on someone who had done something wrong. And I started focusing. I had a friend and we were both focusing on this person and he did us wrong and da 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 And it was like falling from the heavens. It was like falling to earth. And I couldn't get the magic back. And I couldn't understand why. So cut to, that's a, it's a really important part of the back, back story. So cut to 10 years later. Now I'm a mother and I go on this journey of wanting to go to Sierra Leone to create a documentary. So I'm wanting to follow this path, right? So I find myself four years later and I, you know, blood, sweat, and tears tried to get the money to do this documentary and I finally get there. I get off of the plane and every hair on my body stands on end. I smell a smell that smells like ancient history. Um, Everyone looks like my mother, my father. There's my uncle Ernie. There's my Aunt Easter. There's my Aunt Minnie. There's my grandmother. There's like my grandfather picking up my luggage. Like it is, it's so incredible and I can't tell you what it feels like to go to a place where everyone looks like you especially having been raised in a place where I didn't feel like I belonged I felt like I was tolerated but not wanted right I felt like okay well she's here now but you know so I didn't care if this place was the least developed country on the planet this, these were my people, and this was home, right? And that's how I felt. And I, I landed in Senegal two days prior to it, and it was equally as divine and stunning, and the women were looking like gazelles. It was amazing. But it was something about Sierra Leone that was just stunning to me. And so I lived in a diamond mining village for three months. Um, there was a school in the middle of the village that had been burned down by the rebels during the war. And we told the story of this this young boy, um, and I fell in love with the villagers, and I came back, and, well, before that, basically, we started a school, right? The long story short is, there was a school in the middle of the village. It had no walls and no roof, but there were 100 children gathering every single day to go to this shell of a building. 
I had never seen a thirst for knowledge like that. For me, going to school was something I had to be forced to do. It was something that was deeply unenjoyable. And so to see these children have such pride and such love for learning, I decided I had raised $5,000 outside of my film budget. And I decided that I was going to use this to put a new roof on the school, cement the floors. It was actually my director at the time who said, you need to invest this money into something that will last. And it's important to note that because my mind was very Western-minded, right? I would have used that money to buy everybody uniforms. Just, you know, really not understanding the lay of the land, we'll say, right? And so I did that. I did just that. And the next thing we know, voila, the school was born. Um, one of the greatest moments of my life was driving to six different villages to get the wood for the roof for the school from a truck that we borrowed from the United Nations and going to get school supplies and everything. And when we pulled into the village after this arduous, long, laborious trip to pick up everything, the entire village spills into the street singing and dancing, saying they always say they'll come back, but they never do. Ugh. I mean, I, I just still, if I take myself back to that moment, I can just feel myself being, you know, rocked and what that meant, what that meant. So that was the beginning of Shine on Sierra Leone. <laughs> But little did I know. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes, the quote of my lifetime, is by the Oshawa tribe. If you're coming to help us, you're wasting your time. If you're coming because you know that your liberation is bound up in ours, then let us work together. Wow. I didn't know what that meant back then. And it is probably the most profound, most true. It is. It just, it is us. And so I came back to Los Angeles and I launched Shine on Sierra Leone and I'm getting my friends involved and we're raising money and things are going good. Building another classroom. And then about two years in, I hit a wall of depression. It was like a 300 foot concrete wall, right? I couldn't figure it out. And Kelly, people would say, oh, I love what you're doing in Sierra Leone. And I would feel like a fraud inside, right? Because I knew something was off, but I didn't know what it was. And so in fashion, I just looked up and said to the universe and said, what am I not getting? What is this feeling? Please tell me. And that began a journey over the course of a year of me just diving deep. Now, a little bit about myself at the time. I was the mother of a seven-year-old daughter. Uh, I could barely make ends meet, and I had absolutely no business starting an organization, <laughs> taking care of anybody else's children. Okay, not at all. And I started to meditate every day. I started to try on something that was called at the time shifting my mindset, right? And that meant only focusing on what felt good, what I wanted, and putting no attention on what didn't feel good and what I didn't want. So that meant a couple of things. It meant that I let go of watching the news, right? It also meant that I had to let go of a certain friendships and relationships that were rooted in complaining, and that was our bond, right? Like I would have the, the one friend that you get together and talk about how hard it is to get a job, or the one, you know. Yeah. And so I had to let those go. Um, and I did this Jedi mind trick style, right? Like I would stop and just look at the flowers. I would look at trees and just spend 60 seconds with a leaf, falling in love with it, right? My daughter, my daughter felt it, but the most important thing is her father, the father who hadn't contributed to her life up until that point. And I made it my business to let him know that he was the worst father on the planet, mm -hmm. right? That was my job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And so I gave it up. 
And I decided to put all of that aside and make sure that I could do whatever it took to make sure that her and her father had a good relationship, even if that meant me taking her to see him every weekend and just operated out of love. He felt the difference. My daughter felt the difference. Everyone did. And within three months, three months or so, my life was very different. Within a year, my life was unrecognizable. So as I was coming out of my metamorphosis, something really magical occurred. Um, when we first opened the school, it was ranked number 736 out of 736 schools. <laughs> so we could only go up from there. And also when we first opened the school, I created a list of affirmations with the children. There were 10 of them. All of my needs are met. I have friends all around the world. My teacher loves me. I'm an excellent student. I'm a sponge for knowledge, on and on. And the children would say them in the morning and in the afternoon. But these children had the magic ingredient. They would sing them. They would dance them, right? They loved these affirmations, I love right? It. I love it. And they had been saying them for maybe about five years or so now, right? And when I called, as I was emerging out of my own cocoon, I found out that our school was now ranked number five out of 736 schools. Wow. Today it's ranked number two out of 736 oh schools gosh. in the region, right? And that was when I got that tap on the shoulder. And that tap said, there's your proof of concept. Investing in the inner development is equally as important as investing in the outer development, if not more. Mm. And see, this was 15 years ago, and it's important to understand that 15 years ago, having this type of conversation about energy and investing in a child in Africa's inner development, they were like, what are you talking about, right? I couldn't go to any conference and raise money in that way. And so this proof of concept was something that I really needed to be able to show we didn't have the best teachers. We had great teachers that loved their students, but we didn't, we didn't have anything other than this mm -hmm. going on for us, right? And so that's when that became the ethos of Shine On, um, and I understood that what was wrong with me and Shine, Shine On. I was going around and preaching their sad stories, right? Mm -hmm. I was be believing and aligning with them that their government was corrupt, right, and that poor them and that it was hard when instead I could be focusing on the power of who they are and helping them to know the power of who they are, right? And so I, re I shifted that completely inside of me to even when I would spend time there, instead of looking at, the, at what I was looking at as, oh, wow, you know, that looks sad, just literally seeing beauty, mm. seeing the beauty of it seeing the the power in it it's such a small thing but it's enormous mm -hmm. and so i changed our name from a charity to a partnership right and i asked them if they indeed wanted to be our partners and so we started to work together in that way and that is the beginning right <laughs> <laughs> that was the beginning of the the a real shift in my healing um, and my understanding of how we're made and what we're made of. And 10 years into doing the work in Sierra Leone, 10 years, um, f six computer literacy centers later, um, thousands of children being educated, uh, children and women's health care center with 30,000 people being seen each year. and over 10,000 microloans for women and men to start or expand a business with a repayment rate never under 95%. That under the bridge, 10 years into this, it's been 15 years now, I decided to get my DNA test done. And I found out that my entire maternal lineage is from a little lady in Sierra Leone. Oh my gosh, wow. And so it was my Again, that tap on the shoulder that I was really being called home for, by the ancestors to do this work with the community. And here's what that did for me. In a time where, 
you know, I, Shine on Sierra Leone was started when the, the cool organizations were started, mm -hmm. right? Like the Charity Waters and the, you know, like the super organizations and wanting to have the great idea, the Millennium Villages, like who's going to win? You know, even with the United Nations, like the Millennium Development Goals, we got to get, you know, that whole sense of competitiveness, I was definitely a part of that and wanting to have the best idea mm -hmm. to shift and change things. What happened when I found out I was from Sierra Leone is that all fell away because I realized that I was just being called home and we're here to work together and we're create, we're planting seeds that may bloom this lifetime. They may bloom many lifetimes from now. And this is, I'm a part of such a bigger story. Mm. And it feels so good. And it really took me out of that ego, which is a big part of the work that we do, and into self and into the whole. Yes. I love that. It makes me think of Mother Teresa's quote that I love. It's like, there's something to do, and I'm, I'll probably mess it up <laughs> royally, but it's it's like, there's there's no great things. Do not aim to do great things. Exactly. Do small things with great love. Mm, and I so love for each of us that want to mm. feel like our purpose needs to be so big and global and, you know, e like eternal and we want to be infamous or whatever our drive is, it's like, no, if we if we tend to our small patch of garden on the earth, yours yes. happens to be in Sierra mm. Leone, and we go to whatever home we're called to do the work. That's right. Then we create this diverse, biodiverse Ooh, love garden on the planet of, you know. Yes, you yes, know I mean? yes. Um, um, so I love that. The, what makes me think of is scale. Scale was such a big part of that time and period that I'm talking about, you know, organizations, Everyone wanted to know, well, what's your scale plan? How will you scale? I know. I was going to ask you that. I'm like, not even about scale, but like, how can we take yeah, this exactly. and duplicate it? Like, beyond <laughs> right? Scale, yeah, and that's, you know? you know, that's the culture that we are a part yes. of. Yes. And what I realized when this happened is that for me, it is about scaling inward. And what that actually looks like, the work is never done yet. We have this great story. But we have so much individual work and trauma to heal within the people that we work with. Sure, this can be somebody else can do something similar. Absolutely. But it should not be looked at as though the work is done once you take it and completely duplicate it. That depth, that excavation, right, that is necessary for us to continue to live each and every day. I'm working on myself daily. Mm -hmm. so, so as uh, there's so many directions I want to go with this, um, I'll, I'll get to your daily practices yes. later. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that, um, you know, you even talked about it before, and I heard you say, you know, you're trying to help get these aid dependent, this aid dependent village out of dependency, and you're doing that now as a partnership. And mm -hmm. just the fact that um, you told a story of how, in even in that region, it was it's looked at as the white man has the power and the money that because they're oh. always the one that show up in the aid uniforms. Definitely, today. and so. <laughs> I think that it's just, it's so interesting where even these kids are associating, you know, this, this idea of appearance mm. and, and then you, you shift to talk about your work and as a casting director and, and really focus on representation. Mm. And I would love for you to share the story of, you know, why representation is so important mm. because I think that there's a lot of people listening who still don't understand or especially a lot of yeah. white people listening that yeah. we just again we're fish in the water we grow up all we saw was white people on TV white that's people in the right. magazines and yeah so we've we're just like innately yeah. included that's we're, right we're normal you know? <laughs> exactly but for a little girl mm. you know you told the story tell me that tell us the story of when you first realized you were black yeah and that disconnection mm. and then later reconnection with oh yes yeah. uh, it started on a Monday second grade 
and I went to a private school, Catholic school, nuns and all. And there were about three black children in the class. You know, that was pretty much the ratio. And it started on a Monday. I just became really curious. And I started to look at everyone around me. And so I'm looking at Kelly and I'm like, okay, her hair is yellow and it swings like that. And I'm looking at, you know, uh, Mary and her hair is black, but it also swings like that. You know, so, and then I go home and on the way home, I'm looking at every billboard, right? And so this entire week I'm studying. I'm studying my environment. And I go to my baby book, and it says, Welcome, Tiffany, to the world, new baby girl. But there's a, a drawn picture of a white baby, right? And so I'm looking for myself everywhere. And yes, if I were to turn on the TV, there were a couple of black TV shows, but that was it, you know? And on the black TV shows, I couldn't find someone that was my complexion. Now that is something I was obsessed with. I needed to see dark-skinned Tiffany doing her thing <laughs> as an adult. <laughs> I was looking for that. I needed to feel validated, right? So I couldn't find myself. So on Friday, I get in the car with my mom and I say, mom, I give her all of my data. I just share. I found this, I saw this, I saw that. And she goes, oh, it's because you're black. And it was as if, the world shut down on me. And I decided I don't want to be black because everywhere I looked in the world, I didn't see anything that felt and looked beautiful that was black. And so shortly thereafter, I found myself in music class, right? And I'm sitting there with the teacher and I walk in the class and kids are going nuts and she's telling them, I've told you so many times, sit down, raise your hand, you know, and then I will call on you, you can ask for the instrument that you want, right? Nobody's listening. And so I just had the mind to sit and perfectly raise my hand, right? And she calls on me and she says, Tiffany, go choose your instrument. And from now on, you never have to ask. You can just come right into class and get your instrument. And for some reason, from that moment, I learned that if I were to just be good, just be nice, just be smiling, kind, and happy, that I could get what I wanted in this world that didn't look like me. And so also within my own family, when I went to visit my cousins in Detroit, you talk like a white girl, you know, like that whole, I wish that my butt was bigger. Like I just I did not feel like I was black enough for my black people, my black family, my black friends. Um, and obviously I wasn't white. So what that did is I grew up, I started to, I went through a couple of phases. One, I fought to go to public school so that I could be with my black community, all right, so that I could feel more like myself. But after graduating and getting into the big white world, I became a master at assimilating. Assimilating and giving away parts of my blackness so that I would just fit into any room that I went into. And not until I stepped off that plane in Sierra Leone at 33 years old, did I, for the first time, feel proud to be a black person person, a black woman, and I started to pull parts of myself that had been missing for so long. The greatest gift of my life. What's interesting about this is I understand now that these are the symptoms of, this actually keeps white-centric white culture in place. A part of me disassociating with myself, right? also meant that I would disassociate with other people who weren't playing the part that I thought that they should be playing to fit into society in the right way, right? So, oh, well, this person, and I'm gonna just, you know, it's actually funny because I feel like this is such a private moment, but I wanna share it and I think it's important. But referring to someone in my community as ghetto, not okay, right? Mm -hmm. 
not okay. And that is a part of white supremacy is this idolation of the dominant culture and assimilating, just simply assimilating to the dominant culture. So I, you know, I learned that and it's been such a gift for me to share that with the young people that I, that are in my life now here in the States today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why it's so representation just to show young kids that they're we, we need to de-dominize the culture. Yes. So back to that, I wanted to see myself so that I could feel uh, that I belonged here, literally just belonged on planet Earth. Mm. Now, another thing, so I, you know, I've really been studying culture, right, and white-centric culture, and can I ask you a question? Yeah. When I say the word white supremacist, what are the images that come to mind? Well, had I not educated myself after George Floyd was killed, I would picture KKK members with white hoods, skinheads or neo-Nazis, um, you know, the extreme white supremacists. But what I know now is that this belief in white supremacy is actually much more subtle and insidious. And it's actually a belief that's woven into the fabric of our nation, which was disturbing to find out. And um, it still exists in many of the institutions today. White supremacy is truly what's embedded in our everyday lives okay. and that we are all a part of perpetuating it, mm -hmm. all of us. And so when I talk about assimilation, when I talk about othering of my community and um, just unknowingly perpetuating white supremacy in my own life, it's just so important to understand that. So history, oh, that's a big one. That's a big one. I would sit in history class completely bored out of my life. I couldn't even keep my eyes open. And now I understand why, right? I literally be falling asleep. And, you know, everything in history that I learned about, and of course you know this, was a perspective of the story that showed white dominance. And the only time that I saw my people were these sad, sad drawings of slavery. Mm -hmm. That was the only time. Did I know that the first heart surgery was performed and made possible by a black man? Did I know that one of the first or the first female millionaire was a black woman? Did I know that we had a black Wall Street and we were doing our thing in 1921? No. I actually believed that we were inferior because all of the evidence shows it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a couple of black doctor here, you know, our lawyer there, but the evidence is here. How can I, how can a young person feel good about themselves and believe and get affirmation of what they can be or do? Yes, you have the outliers who go beyond and believe in themselves, but that's not the mass consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so taking care of each other means that we create a society and a world that educates us about the whole and one another. And now that we know that, what are we going to do? Such an important conversation because even myself, you know, I grew up in Long Beach, went to public schools. Yes. I was, you know, whites were kind of a minor minority mm -hmm. in, in my population. And my first, you know, CD I bought was Dr. Dre's The Chronic. Like, I would never, <laughs> ever think I had an ounce of racism in my body. I'm like, that was a great know, album. It was like, great. <laughs> Still know every word. But, uh, That's so, awesome. But once, you know, obviously, George Floyd happened and, you know, like I, I was compelled to read and educate myself about white supremacy in our nation and yeah. how deeply embedded it is just yes. in the fabric of every institution and, and we all are perpetuating it unknowingly mm -hmm. or, you know, a large group of yeah. the population is doing knowingly. it knowingly. But, it, that, but that's such a small yeah. part of the problem really yeah. you know what I mean yeah. it's so much more that's the tip of the iceberg yeah. I guess you should say and so to understand that and not be triggered by white supremacy I have a whole new definition of it now mm. I have a whole new perception of it now and even wow, to the really. fact where like white people are only you know mm. 
to say, oh, they're not that black. Like, what? <laughs> like, they're no, they're educated. He went to Stanford. They're not that black. It's like... So you've heard for, that, huh? For people who, you know, yes. that was like the norm growing up. It's like, they're not... They're you not know, that he's, black? He, it's just crazy that that's even in, like... So, and, and mm, just to get down to this... Yes. Just to get down to the fact that mm. genetically, we are like... 99 percent there's this is, skin pigmentation is just skin pig, pigmentation it yeah. has nothing to do with that's why i love agape so much i walked in and it's the most mm -hmm. represented it is the microcosm mm -hmm. of the human, human. family it it's truly is black white yellow purple yes, yes, rich poor yes fat thin young old so good gender you know everything um, and that's where we're headed. That's where we are going, you know, and, but representation and what you and others have done in media to try and say, mm -hmm. look, we need to just sh de dominize the white, you know, population in media so that we can show everybody that we're all equal. There's everybody has a role to play. Everybody is a beautiful, you know, different looking flower in the garden, you know? Truly. So... And I just love your approach because I'm sure there's anger. I'm sure there's so much pain and emotion and mm -hmm. you want to fight against. So, but like, how do you see, mm -hmm. how do you see the next 20 years going? I mean, <laughs> we felt like Martin Luther King Jr. did so much in his, you know, for civil rights and, and everybody that marched and, you know, put their lives at risk with him. But yeah. what, like, what do you see is, is, our work the next our 20 work. years. Wow, this is big. Um, I believe that there's a broader conversation beyond race and gender that encompasses all of this, right? And it's making the decision of how are we going to treat each other? Are we going to take care of each other? Are we going to do it or not? And this, it really, it's, it's how I live my life as far as, you know, if I believe that what I focus on, I attract more of, um, it's just, that's what it is. Like, <laughs> that's just it. Yeah. I'm not going to like, well, but not this time while I'm talking about, when I'm talking mess about this person, you know, because that person was bad. I'm not going to, you can't try it on and try it off. Are we going to take care of each other or not? And if we are, then the process of dismantling and unpacking and unraveling our white supremacist, our white, our white centric world, it will start by everyone starting with their individual self and what is at reach around them. And that is something I really like to just take a moment and pause about because when we talk about these issues, they seem so enormous and we have this idea that we have to go out and change the world. Mm -hmm. But I truly believe, and I am participating in it in this way, that it's, our, it's concentric circles. It starts with me and whatever my reach is around me. Um, May I share an example of that? Please. So a year ago, well, April 27, 2020, in the span of 30 minutes, I inherited my brother's four children, all teenagers, 13, 14, 15, 16. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> back to back Every teenagers. part of puberty. Wow. Girl. Um, Hormones. I mean... And I was living a life where I had raised my daughter. She's 22 now. So I had just become an empty nester. And I was you know, living in my little cabin with my cute little cabin in Topanga. And all of a sudden I have this enormous responsibility. So it really grounded me. It steadied me. And I immediately thought, huh, so my liberation is bound up in them. Wow, I couldn't have imagined it, but okay, let's do this. And when I said that and fully embraced that, it felt literally as if the world just opened up and held me and supported me. 
it's one thing for us to say, you know, we use sister and brother a lot. We have really deep connections with people. That's my family. That's my sister. But I got to experience community showing up in action, probably for one of the first times in my life. Because yes, your friends will take you out to dinner when you're feeling sad, talk about a you know broken heart and these things. But taking on four children, you have to have a village. So I got to experience community in action. I also had something extraordinary happen. I immediately lost the desire to be on this wheel of trying to get somewhere, Mm. right? That I had been on, right? Just where's the next place I'm going? You know, like can't wait to get there and then experience that joy for a little bit. And then where's the next place I'm going? All of a sudden, I felt, I feel this enormous sense of right here, right now, today. I get to choose to be stressed out because there's another dish in the sink (laughs) that was left there or lovingly have a conversation or wash it and experience growth from that moment. I mean, it's it's astounding Mm. and it's challenging. And if I can get through this, I am impacting the world by just working on these five, because I have five children, these five relationships and my mother, (laughs) which is a whole other relationship, (laughs) right? And really taking those as they come on a daily basis, that's my growth. That's my expansion. And that is my contribution. So if in the next 20 years, we were just to focus on what was around us. And for me, that also includes being a casting director, being a director of empathy, and, a, and making sure that we are celebrating humanity. You know, inclusion, we can call it that, but I like saying celebrating humanity. Let's celebrate each other. Mm. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I, lo- I mean, this liberation quote. That you said, I, you know, it's now affecting me so profoundly. It's like, my liberation is bound up with yours. yours. Like, I'm just thinking, I'm, it's a, you know, people know me. They know that I've got a person in my life where I don't want my liberation to be bound up with them, but it is. <laughs> and so to just switch your perspective, like it's that. so, mm. it's so profound and so simple and it's just a way again it's like not making the other not making the out the exterior the external the you know institutions and behemoth of like this massive social changes that are needed right that's so overwhelming but just to go no what is here what is now what is Mm -hmm. in my life where I can turn within, Mm -hmm. and they're the catalyst for my work, for my growth. My liberation is bound up with them. And that just brings us into the present and takes us out of the overwhelm of trying to to turn the tanker all by ourselves. It's like, let's do what we can do Do. in our daily lives Mm -hmm. to celebrate our humanity and others and connect and heal ourselves so that we can be compassionate to other people. Yes. And we will have opportunities. All, we have opportunities all day, every day, just right in front of us. There's an email right now that's in your box, and you can decide on how you want to respond. Mm. You can decide if you want to be annoyed again that this person is doing that. You know, these are the, just the these micro, micro, um, I want to say they're micro, but they're like the most powerful yeah. uh, things that we can do. And then there is that one person who will be able to vote yes or no on a bill and be able it's sitting in that Congress seat. Everybody has to do it. But if we all do that, we got a beautiful something ahead. I'm like, I got something else ahead. No, and it's like, but also just again going back to your example of you create the shift in yourself. You do the metamorphosis. The kids singing their affirmations for five years, and you move 743 right. rungs up the ladder. That's right. You do the work, and you turn within, and you're doing the meditation, and all of a sudden you're the director of empathy, a, a role that was created for you, shifting mm. our own energy. 
sends out waves of creation that are so powerful. Yes. And don't yes. underestimate. That's again, don't Mother Teresa. It. There's you know, don't focus on doing great things. Do small things with great love. I uh, love that one. That was that's a good one. That yes. Um so real quick because you're so you're doing the work. You've you're such an example of love and connection and um, just healing. You're healing a village and a lineage in Sierra Leone. You're healing mm. yourself. You're it's still hard to hear that, by yeah. the way. I don't. I don't actually feel comfortable. It's like <laughs> I'm not doing yeah, more. You're, but I know those people. Yes. Yeah. You're, <laughs> you're a light worker for sure. Okay. Um, who have been some of your for people out there that like want to tap into their own magic and reconnect with themselves? Who have been couple of your favorite teachers, mm. whether it's in the form of a book, mm-hmm. um, and then also what are your daily practices that you Ooh, rely on? Okay, okay, okay. Um, my absolute baby is Esther Hicks. Yes. <laughs> that is just, oh, I, I know that I was a part of bringing Abraham through. I was one of the, the, the million like desires that was a part of that. So es- Esther Hicks, uh, Abraham is my my go to, I'd go to. I, I, I'll tell you about that in my daily practices. But Esther Hicks, Wayne Dyer, just I'm in. I love him so much. <laughs> I love him so much. Um, and oh, new play of last two years. I think it's been Mark Nepo. Seven thousand ways to listen. He is. He's a poet, but I like to call him a retriever. He is a retriever of the most beautiful. Um, his words are wands. Wow. So he is my absolute favorite, and I've been spending time with him. Uh, Sadhguru is lovely as well, and he has a new book called Karma, and it so, so beautifully unpacks the misuse of the word and term karma, but what it's really... Uh, how it's really just so well to f- explained. It's that's a great one. Okay. And yeah, I think that's it. That's okay, enough. Good. Those are good ones. Yeah. Um, I also Abraham Hicks, and I mean, I would just listen. <laughs> Wayne Dyer, change your thoughts, change your mind, and yes. Abraham Hicks on repeat, running, you know, miles and miles and driving, commuting to auditions that I'm sure yes. you were a part of. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So what are your my are daily, daily practices? practices yeah. So what I've done is over the years, I have collected and I have a toolbox, right? And I just allow myself to be inspired to know what I want to do for in, a, in a particular day, right? So no matter what, TM when I first wake up, mm. no matter what. That's transcendental meditation Thank for those you. of you. Thank you very much. And if I can do it twice a day, great. But some of the other things I might pepper in is a, an om meditation. Um, that's an out loud meditation. Uh, chanting nam Yoho renge kyo for 10 minutes. Oh, yummy. And a little bit of, it's just a little yoga it's like teeny, teeny, mm-hmm. <laughs> teeny, teeny. And then I do a 30-minute exercise with this wonderful teacher that I have on Zoom three times a week. And that just connects me to my body and makes me feel so good mm. because that's something that I hadn't done for many years. So that was a gift from the pandemic Yes, mm-hmm. is being able to get into that. Movement, feels, right? Movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think that's it. They're beautiful. What I do want to say is this, and it's something that you would definitely know and are familiar with with Abraham, but it's the idea that contrast is really an essential part of creation. Yes. And that has really been the foundation of everything that I am today. When contrast, which is something that I don't have planned, something that does not meet my blueprint, something that does not feel good, happens in my life, I can pretty quickly shift to the knowing that, okay, a gift has arrived. And being able to shift my vibration 
and receive the answer to this contrast has been something that uh, it moves me on so many levels. And so that understanding, this understanding that contrast is literally the gateway to all that we want, it really helps me feel more positive about what we could possibly achieve if we were simply all to shift our mind. Forget about what's happening right now. If we could raise our vibration as a unit, could you imagine? Mm. Yes. It's just a nice thought. It's such a nice Bask thought. in that for a minute. <laughs> it's so true though too. Like we we are we constantly fight against that contrast. We resist what we don't want coming into our life. We resist a behavior that our partner displays. We resist something that comes in that is not what we want. But if you listen to Abraham or Esther, um, and any of these teachings along these same lines, it's the contrast comes into our life to, sh to show us what we don't want so then we can pivot to what we do want. Mm -hmm. And just like your beautiful awakening of, you know, letting go of the complaining, letting go of fixating on what that, the, the other, that what that person did to me and just really committing right. to focusing on what it is you do want, focusing mm -hmm. on love and how that shifts energy in you and then all of a sudden you're, Everything you're, else. you're the father of your child is behaving differently that's right you shift you and everything around you shifts and contrast is a gift yeah. something that we don't want is a gift some diagnosis mm -hmm. is a gift to it show is. us we need to focus on what we do want where where are we out yeah. of alignment with what we want yes so yeah. thank you for sharing your magic your story your tools and practices and, and learnings um, and experience. And I just, I'm so, we could talk forever. So I'm just, I'm so thankful that you're here today. And, and I'm so happy to be here. The work you're doing in Sierra Leone as well. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's magic being with you. <laughs> so where can people find you? And if, and 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 I think you know, it's if they want to support Shine on yes. Sierra Leone, where can they find you personally and and yeah. support that organization? Absolutely, shineonsierraleone.org. I uh, would love your support and come visit. Just come visit. It is a, something special to um, to meet these children, to be in this environment. It's transformative. And you can find me on Instagram, Tiffany Persons. <laughs> awesome. Go follow <laughs> Tiffany. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly.